It's hard to believe that barely 10 years ago, a mountain of trash loomed here. Since the 15th century, Cairo's inhabitants had been dumping their garbage on this hill. And yet, from the filth and refuse, a miracle was born. It was a huge challenge to transform this mountain of trash into a garden. The first time Leila and I set foot here, we sank right down up to our thighs. There was garbage everywhere. It was really disgusting. At first, we thought it was impossible to create a garden here. Our initial reaction was, you've got to be kidding. It was unthinkable to do anything here at all. Every attempt to build something on this site met with failure. That's why it stayed the way it was for 600 years without anything happening. What's more, the district where it lies, Darb al-Amar, was known to be the haven of drug dealers and criminals. It gave off a very negative impression. This place had a really bad reputation. When we got here, the challenge turned out much bigger than we'd expected. Problematic ground, difficult environment, geotechnical complications, everything was against us. But despite all these obstacles, we met the challenge. We wanted to prove that there were professionals in Egypt capable of building a park on a global scale, despite all the difficulties. Beneath this pile of trash, lay a buried treasure. The ancient wall of the city, bordering on the old district of Dar al Amar. Create a garden, as well as restore the 1.5 kilometers of this 12th century rampart, such was the crazy idea of Prince Karim Argan Khan, the wealthy heir of a great Middle Eastern family. Back in the 1980s, the art and culture-loving philanthropist had sensed the amazing potential of this giant trash heap. With the help of his foundation, he changed the fate of the polluted and congested Egyptian capital by offering it this lush park. It took four years for us to build the park, two years below ground and two more above. Two years of constant digging. Today, when people visit the park, they're impressed by the work that's been done on the surface, but they don't realize that just as much work went on underground to clear the land. While today the pristine green offers a stark contrast to the surrounding ochre, getting here was no small feat. How to make this ground fertile and allow plants to grow? How to structure, enrich, and above all, purify the various pollutants that were dumped here over the past 500 years? We analyzed the soil, and the results were even worse than we'd feared. We realized the quantity of salt present in the ground was higher than in the Red Sea. The vegetation we planted only lasted 48 hours before it died. What's more, the soil here wouldn't allow any water to penetrate. So what we had to do was blend the original soil with other materials that would allow water to penetrate down to the roots. Otherwise, all the plants would die. We added sand to the original soil, and the plants finally managed to grow. The hills on the western slope are crossed with winding paths where each bend offers a perspective of the city. The park shows its true colors to the neighborhoods around it, providing the inhabitants of Dar al Amar, the working class district below, their luxurious setting. The city of a thousand minarets changes into a magical display for Egyptians who are once more proud of their city. When you walk through Al-Azhar Park, you feel that its design is very successful because it creates a real link between people and their environment. That's what was missing from Cairo's other parks. Architecturally speaking, Cairo has undergone many changes, but the city has always been an ensemble of dense constructions, packed tight against each other. 
The city is more horizontal than vertical. We've even encroached on some other parks to create streets or build buildings. Al-Azhar Park is an example that counters this phenomenon. In this sprawling, congested metropolis, where buildings fight for height and only the Nile Delta offers a sensation of space, the infinite horizons of Al-Azhar Park are a blessing. We know that in Germany or Iran, there are 17 square meters of green area per person. In Egypt, the green area available for each individual is barely a foot. In Cairo, we uh, really suffer from a lack of green. It would take another 10 parks, such as this one, to meet the needs of Cairo's 17 million inhabitants. The second thing, and perhaps the most important, is that 60 years before Al-Azhar Park was created, if I'd told an inhabitant of Cairo to go for a stroll in a park, he would have gaped at me and laughed in my face. Most people considered parks to be dirty places, ugly and dangerous. They were noisy places where you got harassed. Parks aren't part of our culture. When Al-Azhar Park opened, it showed everyone that no matter who they were or how important, whether they were rich or modest, a child or an old lady, a civil servant or simply anybody, Everyone could enjoy this sort of public space. The park was designed to bring cultures together and for different social classes to rub elbows any time of the day, morning, afternoon or evening. And that has been Cairo's great turning point towards modernity. Al-Azhar Park seems to achieve the impossible. The fusion between the secret paradise of the walled gardens of the Orient and spontaneous nature within everybody's reach. To end our walk on a high note, at the end of the path lies an open-air theater nestled against the ramparts, a stage for song and dance. When the park was created and opened in 2004, we tried to set ourselves apart by making it not only a place for walking, but also for leisure and culture. Culture doesn't simply come from walking along the paths. It's transmitted through the many different activities we've initiated in the park. There are musical performances, as well as a permanent theatre down at the bottom of the park. In reality, people don't come simply to walk. They also come to take advantage of the daily cultural programs we offer them. On Fridays, we stop the fountain and offer an outdoor concert or other cultural performance. There's a range of diversity in the choice of activities on offer. People gather around and really appreciate these moments. I'd like to tell a little story that moved me. We were in the park and a very poor man who was on a walk with his family hurried up to me. He asked if I was the one who created the park. Yes, it was me, I answered. He wrapped his arms around me and gave me a big hug, thanking me warmly for such a beautiful garden. It was an incredible feeling, unlike anything I'd ever felt before. He said something that surprised me. You can tell that the person who runs this park respects us as human beings, and in exchange, this is a place we want to respect.